Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I think we'll begin as participants continue to keep joining. We're very, very excited to be here today despite the circumstances of COVID. Um, I'm really, really pleased that we've had um, excellent responses from our speakers, from our, uh, today we have our keynote speaker, we have our chief guest, but also the audience. Uh, given that COVID cases are rising all over the world and in Bangladesh, I'm just glad that we can be here today. We have our chief guest, Dr. Flora, uh, also here today. So it's a very, very important launch for us. I just wanted to say this conference was an idea that's been germinating since last year. Uh, but uh, we have had several discussions with uh, Dr. Mushtaq Chaudhry, who's the convener of Bangladesh Health Watch, but also Professor Masood, who's the director of Center for Health Systems at JPG and our senior uh, professors and uh, many other colleagues. And we felt it was very important to take stock, reflect and understand what's been happening on the ground, particularly bringing together diverse perspectives from academics, researchers, development partners, practitioners, because I think it is very important, we felt, to not only learn from each other lessons, but even failures are often very insightful as we move forward. I don't think I thought it'd be 2023 and we'd still be experiencing COVID. Maybe I was just a lot, slightly a little bit more optimistic uh, than others, but here we are, but we're managing, but there's lots of risks and vulnerabilities to disadvantaged communities and lots of impacts uh, economically, socially, um, in many, many different countries, including Bangladesh. Welcome, Dr. Flora from Switzerland. Our government chief guest is joining us all the way from Switzerland, so we really are grateful for her presence today. What I can say is COVID, which we all know, has revealed the existing fault lines that, that, that are there. It revealed and magnified structural and social inequalities and equities. It's not that it suddenly happened, it just brought into the forefront being a global pandemic. It also show, showed how certain disadvantaged groups were disproportionately affected and need support from policies to programs to interventions. And here we just see an increased disruption in everyday life and also the increasing fragility of many, many communities and individuals across households and amongst the most vulnerable, but even across many, many people who are working in lives in general, emotionally, mentally, physically. I just want to point out that this conference really brings together speakers from 18 different countries, including Bangladesh, with diverse expertise to really inform us about what we can learn, but also take away and critically reflect on the questions that yet need to be asked. We have people from quantitative backgrounds, qualitative backgrounds, ethnographies, as I said, diverse sort of disciplines and professions. And what I really hope we get out of this is to reflect further on the similarities and differences, but also the importance of recognizing why contexts matter when we're looking at policies and programs. And I think certain kinds of research, both qualitative and particularly ethnographies, along with surveys, reveal the complexities and differences and diversities of experiences, be it health, be it illness, be it nutrition, uh, be it access to health services, be it uh, mental health. It also raises this conference, which has had so much support from people and speakers from all over the world, the need for universal accountability, for solidarity, when we start talking about vaccinations and vaccines and access and distribution and intellectual property rights. So these are questions that will emerge. Who knows, we may have another follow-up conference to actually further debate these issues, but I am hopeful that some of this will be addressed as people come together for accountability and solidarity to help each other in countries, across countries and within countries. Bangladesh has a long history of public health successes despite the challenges. James P. Grant School of Public Health has undertaken over 44 research studies, surveys, national studies, impact evaluations, qualitative research on COVID, rural to urban to diverse communities, because we recognize intersectional factors and uh, qualitative along with surveys will give us information, critical evidence that we fed into BRAC, the NGO, Bangladesh Health Watch, Civil Society Platform, many, 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 many actors because evidence is what will keep us going. And the government also has been open and welcome to some of our um, evidence that we've shared. 
So I'm very, very glad to be here today and to be part of the organizing group. It's not just me, but a whole team, including Professor Mushtaq Chaudhry, who's the convener of Bangladesh Health Watch, and of course, Professor Masood Ahmed, who's been working closely with us and an entire team that we're gonna thank. But now I'd like to welcome uh, our Professor Dr. Mushtaq Chaudhry, convener of Bangladesh Health Watch, to say a few words. Thank you very much. Mushtaq Bhai, you have to unmute yourself. It happens to me all the time. Oh, sorry. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Sabrina. Uh, Chief guest, Professor Mirzadi Sabrina Flora, who has just joined. Uh, keynote speaker, Professor David Navarro, uh, colleagues and friends. On behalf of both Bangladesh Health Watch and Brack University, it is indeed a great pleasure to welcome you all uh, to this three-day conference on COVID-19 and the future of health systems. We are going through a most difficult time the world hasn't seen in past 100 years, as you all know. With over five and a half million deaths and 330 million cases recorded, it is still raging unprecedentedly. Two days ago, the Nature magazine postulated that the actual numbers will probably be two to fourfold higher than these official statistics. As Dr. Sabina has said, the pandemic has revealed the weaknesses of the existing health systems in low and middle income countries to deal with epidemics like COVID-19. And we are aware of the limitations of the health system in a natural situation, in a normal situation. The challenge for us is how do we make best use of the present crisis to build a health system, which is not only relevant and ready to fight a COVID-like crisis again, but also is relevant and, resp and responsive to the healthcare needs of every citizen when the pandemic is over. We have seen in the past few different, uh, we have seen in the past how different societies made good use of a crisis to do new and useful things, the things that benefit not only a few, but everyone. The Brits and the rest of Europe build their national health services on the ashes of the Second World War. The Rwandans build their new health system based on the principle of universal health co coverage after the genocide. We also know how the Thais, the people of Thailand, build their universal health coverage system after a worst financial crisis. Ladies and gentlemen, the present crisis will be over, hopefully soon. But the challenge is how do we make, make best out of this crisis for our health systems? This conference will discuss such issues based on the learning from the pandemic in different low and middle income settings. The conference will allow us to identify, among other things, the silver linings and show the way forward to achieving it. The Bangladesh Health Watch joins hands with the Bragg James P. Grant School of Public Health in welcoming you all to this conference. Be well. Be safe. Thank you very much. So at the personal request of uh, Dr. Sabrina Flora, who's actually in between meetings from Switzerland, I'm going to request uh, Dr. Flora to speak next. She is our special chief guest from government. She's the additional director, general health service planning and development of the government. Previously, she was the director of the Institute of Epidemiology, Disease Control and Research in Dhaka. She's also been a valuable support for us throughout COVID, but I've known her from many lifetimes ago when she's given extra additional support to intellectual contributions uh, at, at the school. May I request our chief guest to please share a few words, and we are so grateful that you made the effort to join. Thank you so much, Appa. Uh, thank you very much. I think I'm audible. Am I audible? Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, uh, Actually, it's my, I thought it would be my opportunity to have uh, this opportunity to participate in this international conference on COVID-19 and to discuss about the future directions for the countries like us. Uh, but suddenly I had to come to attend another meeting. So uh, I'm really, um, I do apologize because probably I'm interrupting uh, the schedule. Uh, I'm sorry for that. 
but it's really, um, I'm really happy to be a part of this conference. Uh, I expect uh, the, after a lot of uh, thread and bear discussion, we'll have to um, have some idea from this conference, which would help the government to develop the next policy. Uh, if we look back uh, previous couple of years, uh, Bangladesh government was planning, we had a plan to have uh, how to prepare a country for pandemic preparedness, but at that time we focused mostly on the influenza. Uh, we had some kind of idea that we might have pandemic, which would be caused by influenza virus. We were not prepared to look, uh, to see pandemic the way we are experiencing now. So it gave us lots of uh, challenges. And at the same time, I think it was kind of opportunity for us also uh, in the way uh, the country has developed within this couple of years, which might took uh, a decade uh, if there was no uh, pandemic. So uh, as for example, uh, we had previous few PCR labs, now we have hundreds. Uh, so we do not have that much prepared uh, emergency facilities, which being prepared during this pandemic, the point of entries are being strengthened. So all these were the outcome of different opportunities uh, we've received in, in between facing the challenges. So, and also uh, we learned a lot. I think in the general people also learned a lot. Uh, new words we uh, came in, uh, came to know, like people now can understand what is quarantine. Even medical doctors were not used to, to understand this quarantine isolation. All these issues are very much new for our countries. But at the same time, during pandemic, not only the COVID cases, I think we face challenges for, in providing essential services for other illnesses also other illnesses also. Those things are also we are working on. Uh, we faced, we saw a lot of people uh, scarcity in the human resources. And during this pandemic, government recruited uh, more than 10,000 doctors and nurses uh, who can provide services currently for pandemic, uh, for treating the COVID, giving support to the COVID. But at the same time, uh, they are recruited for definitely to serve the people when the pandemic would be over they will serve for other essential services for this the general people of bangladesh uh, as you know that uh, we are giving providing covid vaccines to uh, free of cost to every citizen of the country and initially we do not have capacity to uh, preserve pfizer vaccine because it has uh, it requires ultra uh, cold chain but Bangladesh has developed that cold chain system also. Now we can uh, provide Pfizer vaccine even from the Upazila level. So these are all, I think, outcome of uh, the development work we did together during this pandemic. Uh, one another aspect of which I want to highlight during this pandemic, uh, usually we, use, we discussed about One Health approach, One World, One Health, but uh, that was focused or cornered with the animal health and environmental health only kind of, uh, I can say kind of silo over there. But during this pandemic, we learned to work together also. Not only uh, whole of the government approach, as well as whole of the society approach we have observed, we have experienced. A government uh, worked uh, keeping hand in hand with the private sectors, NGO sectors, uh, I want to take this opportunity to thank BRAC especially because BRAC provided a lot of support to our um, health system and not only in collecting samples, uh, detecting cases, uh, but as well as in conducting our surveillance system through uh, CST and also uh, now they are supporting us in providing the vaccines. So this is one example of BRAC, but actually we did a lot of partners. We developed a lot of partnerships during this pandemic. And all this learning would help us, all these uh, new dimension of culture to work together will help us to build our capacity in, uh, for future. We don't expect any pandemic 
further, but at the same time, we cannot say anything because due to environmental uh, changes, climate changes and other issues, uh, we have to be prepared for any kind of future pandemic or any kind of emergencies. The, the learning of we obtained during this pandemic, definitely that. Sorry, sorry, my connection was interrupted. The learning we obtained during this pandemic, uh, in uh, mitigating this pandemic, would definitely uh, build our capacity, and that will help us to uh, definitely uh, prevent previous next pandemic. And as well as if we cannot prevent, that would help us to contain and mitigate the next pandemic. Uh, I would definitely look forward uh, for the success of this important conference and would be very happy to, uh, if I can get the recommendations, the way forward, which would be coming out from this conference, the important conference, uh, government will definitely wait for that and will try to accommodate the scientific uh, outcome of this you to use this out scientific outcome of this conference thank you very much once one more time for inviting me and to be a part of this conference and again i do apologize i i'm not able to stay longer uh, actually i understand that i'm loser uh, because i'm going to miss a lot of important discussion which uh which would could be a big opportunity for me to learn further thank you very thank much Thank you, Appa. We will absolutely be in touch with you. And of course, uh, you are fundamental and essential to also our strategies around research and informing policy and programs. So thank you so much for joining us. I know you're somewhere in Switzerland. You probably got connected. So we really appreciate it. We're grateful you could join us. But I'd like to now, it, sorry, Appa, you're on mute, Appa. You're if you me. permit me, uh, I like to uh, leave now because I'm in another program actually. That's okay. okay. Thank you so Thank much. You. Stay safe, Bye. stay well. Bye-bye. Yeah. You, you. you all stay safe also. Bye. I'd like to... Thank you so much. I'd like to now come back to uh, uh, Professor Masu. He's the director of the Center for um, Excellence on Health Systems and Universal Health Coverage. I'd like you to say a few words about the conference as you've been co-organizing with the rest of us at this um event today. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Sabina. So dear respected TV guest, audience, my friends, colleagues, peers, a very, very good morning, good evening, good day, depending upon where you are. In this international conference on COVID-19, we would like to discuss, debate, and document the experiences with COVID-19 pandemic across the low and middle income countries. We'll cover areas, I mean, there are these experiences so much on different aspects in different sectors. And uh, we will just try to cover a part of those, maybe not the whole. So maybe we'll be covering some areas like on you know, health, education, economy, gender, governance, and what can we learn or we can do to prepare for the future healthcare system in, in countries like us for preparing for the next ensuing pandemic which the experts are, I mean, assuming it may happen anytime in future also. So in this conference, we have six sessions in total, including this introductory session. After this introductory session, we have the first scientific session that is uh, uh, just, uh, I think uh, on, for starting from 8 p.m. So the theme is on experiences and learning from two years of COVID-19 pandemic in the LM LMICs for future. Uh, so in this session, we will discuss, discuss about what we have learned so far with respect to what, who is affected, to what extent, and what have been the impact on health and livelihood. This session will have three presentations and it will be chaired by Dr. David McCoy from International Institute for Global Health, United Nations University, Malaysia. Following this next day, that is tomorrow, we will have two sessions. The first session will be on COVID-19 response by the government, development partners and the people the, and the community. So, there will be four presentation in this uh, in this session, and we will discuss about how 
the government responded to uh, this uh, COVID-19 pandemic, what worked and what didn't work, who were left behind, and also how the uh, civil society, the NGOs, the community, and the development partners responded. Uh, this session will be chaired by uh, Professor Kausar Afsana from Black James P. Grant School of Public Health, Black University. The second session of uh, the second day, that is tomorrow, will be on uh, COVID uh, risk communication, data for decision making, and evidence based governance. Very uh, important issues, and lots of debate is going on on every aspect of this whether the risk communication was uh, okay, whether it was culture sensitive or context specific, what were the faults in the governance, you know, how much data helped us in taking uh, scientific uh, decision making. So those kind of uh, issues will be discussed in this session. Uh, this session will be chaired by Professor Ewan Thompson from Professor of International Health Systems Research from Karinsky Institute, Sweden. The, the third, on the third day, the first session, we'll be having on role of social science in pandemic response in case of like uh, COVID-19. There will be five presentations and we'll be discussing about role of social science in responding to the pandemic, understanding and influencing people's behavior during pandemic, what they did and what they didn't and why it was so. We know that the issues with uh, the mask, mask wearing, and then uh, social distancing, all these issues. So what were the underlying reasons for people's uh, this kind of behavior and how it can be, uh, it can be changed uh, for better pandemic response. So those are the issues that we'll be covering. And this session will be chaired by Dr. Sally Theobald uh, from Department of International Public Health, Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine. Liverpool. And the last session, that is the second session on third day, uh, will be on, uh, will be on uh, as a matter of a summation of the discussion that will be, uh, that will be there uh, in the previous days. And we'll be discussing about uh, the structure or the shape of the post-COVID health system and how we can prepare for the next pandemic or epidemic or big outbreaks like that. So. This will be chaired by Dr. Timothy Evans from, uh, he's the Director and Associate Dean School of Population and Global Health and Faculty of Medicine and Associate Vice President from McGill University, uh, Canada. So these are in short, the different things that we'll be covering in these three days. We hope we will be having a lot of interesting uh, data findings and we will, uh, take actively part in this, in the discussion and debate. And we'll try to uh, learn from these experiences and then use it for future uh, endeavor. Thank you very much, Sabina, over to you. Thank you, Professor Masood. Thank you very much. I hope you will join us. I mean, I can see already 170 participants here already joining us from all over the world. A very exciting indeed. Next to our keynote speaker, I, I take great pleasure to introduce you to Dr. David Navarro. He's the special envoy of COVID-19 for the Director General of World Health Organization. He's also a professor and co-chair of the Institute of Global Health Innovation at Imperial College London. He's received many awards, including the World Food Prize in 2018. We're honored to have him here today. Uh, Dr. Dav David Navarro, the floor is yours online. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Dr. Sabina Faiz Rashid. Uh, how lovely, what a nice introduction. Uh, and to Professor Mirzadi Sabrina Flora, who had to disappear, it was lovely to hear from you in your role as Chief Guest and Additional Director General of Health Services of the Government of Bangladesh. It's lovely to be also with Professor Saeed Masood Ahmed, Director of the Centre of Excellence on Universal Health Coverage at Brack University. Uh, alongside Professor Sabina, who's the Dean. And also I'd like to give a special uh, shout out to Professor Ahmed Mustak Chowdhury, former Vice Chair of BRAC and leader of Bangladesh Health Watch. To you 
and to all the 168 participants gathered here, I would like to say, Sakala Samita, Saka Kamedera Suba Dina. And I hope that's clear. I am trying to greet you in my few words of Bangla. I'm honoured to be presenting this keynote lecture today. As, as Dr Sabina told you, I've been working as the special envoy of the Director General of the World Health Organization on COVID-19, actually since the end of January 2020. I work alongside five other special envoys uh, and our job is to amplify the WHO's gu guidance, to interpret it to different governments, organizations, businesses, civil society groups, and indeed all who have a role in the response. Our job is to accompany decision makers as they try to work out how best to respond to the pandemic and to feed back to the WHO what we're hearing. And already I've heard some really important points, even in the first few minutes of this conference, things that need to be fed back because the issues faced in lower and middle income countries as a result of this pandemic are really challenging and we need to explore them with care. That's the theme of my remarks today. What are we learning from COVID-19 that needs to be applied? I prepared a few slides and I'm going to try to show them from my computer. If anything goes wrong, please forgive me, I'll find a solution. And as I show the slides, I'm going to speak and I've timed myself. I am planning to finish in 15 minutes from now. I hope that that will be okay from the point of view of timekeeping. Okay, so now I'm going to do the delicate business of trying to share my slides. It will take a couple of minutes to get organized uh, because not everything is working as I expected it to. Uh, so please hang on just a minute while I get that organized. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay, right. So, um, Noshin, could you possibly share from your computer? Do it as a slideshow. Thank you very much indeed. Yes. I always struggle with this, uh, Dr. David. Mm. Mm. You're, you're one ahead, one step ahead of me. <laughs> thank you. Mm. So, thank you very much indeed. Um, and um, I, I will do everything I can to make sure that um, uh, we are working well. And there's one small reason. Yeah. Okay. So, my um, subject is the COVID-19 pandemic learnings for future healthcare systems. And if we can go to the next slide, what I'd like to do is to show you the daily epidemiological report that WHO produces every day and has done since the beginning of the pandemic. You'll see that this reiterates some of what we heard from Dr. Chowdhury. Uh, but just to, I'd like to I'd like you to look particularly at the graph and especially the coloured shaded portion of the graph, which is a depiction of the number of cases reported to WHO for the previous 24 hours, that is on the 16th of January 19, uh, 2022. Now, the most important thing to, to, to see from this is just how remarkable the situation has changed in the last four weeks. There has been an enormous increase in the number of cases of COVID-19 reported to WHO every day. It's jumped up to over two and a half million cases in the last 24 hours. I mean, this is an extraordinary increase from the level of under one million daily cases that was being reported through most of the pandemic so far. Uh, you can see also that the numbers of deaths each day 
so far is staying relatively stable at around 7,000 cases. And this is in keeping with what we're seeing from reports in many places, that although there's been a really big increase in the number of cases reported, the number of deaths has stayed relatively stable. It's still, however, an extraordinary total number of deaths from the pandemic to date, more than five and a half million. And we know that that's an enormous underestimate, just as we know that the current case numbers are a huge underestimate. And we use the information simply to give us an overall pattern of what is going on. Please remember that daily case numbers are simply an aggregation of the totality of different cases occurring in different settings. And uh, there may well be cases coming up. There may be cases going down. You tend to find that surges of COVID, as I'm sure you're all seeing, are quite localised because this is primarily a droplet spread infection. And you can get a build-up and a surge of cases in one location and 50 kilometres away, the numbers are much smaller. The impact of these high levels of cases is, is multifold. The most important is that it's impacting on health services everywhere. Health services overloaded. Health workers bearing a, a really a, an unfair brunt of the infection. Many situations now, health services not able to perform because health workers are having to uh, take time off because they're ill or because they're isolating. And this in turn is adding to the problem. And in countries with health services that are really not strong, then the impact is just huge. I want to also stress that we're learning that this disease is having an impact right across the whole of society. You don't need me to tell you that this is really affecting on poor people, affecting poor people everywhere. It's impacting on their livelihoods, impacting on their health, impacting on their access to food, impacting on their nutrition. And as uh, we just heard from Professor Sabina Rashid, uh, this is uh, un uh, actually exposing the fault lines in our societies and helping us to understand just how many social and economic challenges have got to be addressed. COVID is the great revealer. Let's move to the next slide, please. Thank you very much indeed. WHO Southeast Asia region with the regional office in New Delhi includes Bangladesh. Uh, this is the local information from the Southeast Asia region. You remember that your own uh, caseload really increased in September, October 2020 with a really dramatic increase. Uh, it increased again even more dramatically in May, June of, uh, sorry, May, June of 2021. Uh, and uh, then it started increasing again now at the beginning of 2022. So just to remember three big surges in uh, September, October 2020, in May, June of 2021, with a subsequent small increase again in July, August, and then a big jump again in numbers of cases, but not mirrored in death numbers uh, at the beginning of 2022. The regional figures are dominated by India, not surprisingly, but I want you to note that Bangladesh has reported large numbers of new cases in the previous 24 hours. Uh, uh, fortunately, not a very large number of deaths. Next slide, please. I thought I would go here now, try to summarize some of the learnings that I've picked up from the COVID-19 pandemic. I mean, there are so many that uh, really uh, I ought to um, have, have longer to share this. So what I'm doing is I'm summarizing some of the points that have really affected me. Most important, I have to keep reminding myself that transmission starts and ends in communities and responses must be community-based. And 
I'm really keen to see them locally integrated with central direction based on expertise, a specialist expertise, but also experience, the, the quality of work that, that is needed, particularly from experienced infectious disease practitioners. It's quite extraordinary how we see in many countries that uh, responses are centrally directed and perhaps not taking account of the uh, needs at community level, how they're often not integrated. So you get hospital services following one series of approaches, public health working differently, often clashes between public health authorities. But you do need central direction. And that's where having experienced uh, incident managers running the response is absolutely vital. WHO has done this from the beginning. <coughs> and science matters. Without good science, we won't get good public health responses. I also like to remind people that the virus is the problem. And as with all infectious diseases, people are the solution. Now, I want to stress that when I'm saying this, uh, this is people everywhere. I, this is a global issue. And in order the, the response is going to be successful, uh, people really do need to be having trust in their leaders. So Sometimes uh, I find that there are instructions given to people, perhaps restrictions, perhaps compulsions like vac vaccination compulsion. It's super hard to engage people in the solution if they don't trust. We learned that with Ebola in West Africa, a disease on which I worked in 2014. And, and uh, it really is, is important. Now, I want to pick up on something that was said in the introduction. If you see the virus as the problem, you've got to understand the virus. This virus is not flu. This is a coronavirus pandemic. We don't have previous coronavirus pandemics on which to model our responses. We have SARS, which was a, lo a localized outbreak. It did spread, but it was managed locally mostly. And, and that has been very useful. Uh, we have to go back a long way to the last suspected uh, coronavirus pandemic. Uh, and quite honestly, people who've based their responses on flu have got into difficulty. WHO is clear, if you're designing interventions, base them on assessments of risk. Again, Dr. Flora brought this up when she spoke, but risk-based working is the key. Use the best, best, best available evidence when deciding risk. Put an emphasis on rapid and robust action. It's really not a good idea to wait around while this virus is transmitting before you respond. Act quickly, act robustly. And uh, I want to stress that once again, we've learned that well-functioning and, and well networked public health services, and by that I mean community-based public health services, are absolutely essential. And it's got to be backed up by robust inside country as well as between country coordination. There's been a rather a lack of this coordination in this response. And... Uh, I also believe that systems leadership, that's an approach to leadership that recognises the importance of every different actor in the response and is a collective form of leadership, which recognises the value of multi-sectoral approaches and multi-stakeholder engagement is key to supporting collective action. It's not too late. Public health services can use systems leadership and should do so. And one of the things that myself and others are working on uh, is trying to find ways to incorporate this approach. It's very different from top-down linear leadership patterns. And I'd be very happy to engage with those of you on what this means in practice, if that turns out to be something you would like to do. Now, let's move to the next slide, please. I want to focus now on the trajectory of the pandemic as I see it, looking forward from now. I tell everybody, the virus is here to stay. It's not going to go away anytime soon. And it continues to evolve. And we know this with all viruses. Every time they divide, 
there's a chance of a mutation. They're tiny, rather unstable creatures, and they often mutate. And the mutations usually have no significance. The virus just dies. But occasionally, very occasionally, these mutations may lead to variants. And WHO has a standing group that looks at different variants as they're identified. There's a lot of work around the world to actually look at the genetic composition of the viruses. The variants are given names from the Greek alphabet. We've had alpha, beta, gamma and delta. Delta turned out to be a particularly nasty variant and it's the one that's moving across the world right now. But Omicron appeared in mid-December uh, and has become the new emerging variant that is likely to become dominant. So what makes a variant dominant? Well, firstly, if it's more transmissible. Secondly, if it can evade any immunity provided by previous infection or by vaccination. But most importantly, a variant has a comparative advantage if it combines greater transmissibility with a lower lethality. <clears throat> People have been re referring to Omicron in the media as mild. WHO doesn't like that. WHO is saying we've got evidence that Omicron can kill people. We know that in settings where there's low population immunity that Omicron is difficult. So we do not like people referring to Omicron as mild. It's a particular challenge in dealing with uh, Western European media right now. So instead we're saying uh, Omicron seems to be less serious in terms of lethality probably because its main area where it attacks people is in the upper respiratory tract, whereas Delta, for example, has a big impact on the lower respiratory tract. Now, societies are working out how to live with this virus, just as societies have had to work out how to live with other viruses, such as HIV. And how do societies do this? Well, you want minimal disruption to people and economies, despite the fact that the virus is present. So you learning to live with a virus is not the same as just letting go and letting the virus do what it wants. In fact, to get COVID ready, it's important that a society <clears throat> has a clear strategy for dealing not just with the virus in the steady state, but also uh, dealing with what might come in the uh, weeks and months to come and that's where being ready for surges is important and finally being COVID ready means learning lessons especially about the inequitable impact of the virus and the importance of well-functioning public health capabilities. Let me come to my last slide and almost this is my most important slide but I've lost it. Uh, does the last slide not there? It's called communicating about the pandemic. Does it appear? Let's see. That's the one. So let's get to that, see if we can get right. I just want to say to you five things that I have been trying to apply to my own communications because there is currently a real lack of trust between scientists, decision makers and the public. And you cannot deal with any public health challenge without trust. What might be some of the things that will help? And as I was thinking this through, preparing for this lecture, I found five words beginning with H that might be important. First, this pandemic affects all of humanity. So it really affects the people with least resources, the poorest people. But there's no value in trying to approach this virus just from the perspective of one subgroup, uh, people from a particular ethnicity or people from a particular nationality. No, we must have a global approach for all of humanity, prioritizing the needs of those who are most uh, uh, in, 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 in the needs of those who are most disadvantaged, whatever those needs are, without discrimination. Secondly, nobody wants to be working in an atmosphere of constant pessimism. And there are reasons to be hopeful. We should be hopeful where it is justified, because it matters for everybody, for me, for you, but particularly for the multiple millions of people whose lives are hurting because of how the pandemic is affecting us. Thirdly, 
we must display genuine humility. And that's because there's so much that is not known about the virus and much to be learned about how it will be behaving. I find it really tricky when I hear others telling me what this virus is definitely going to do in six months time. I haven't a clue and I don't know where they're getting their information from. Fourthly, adopt a whole person holistic systems approach and I add living systems to that when preparing and responding because it's people who work together who have the needed capabilities. And finally, if you are going to be talking about this, you've got to be authentic. And to be authentic, that means being honest, as honest as you can be to yourself and to others about what the evidence supports, but also about what is contested. Uh, but absolutely never make unjustified promises like it will all be over in six months and certainly don't make empty pledges. Public health depends on trust and trust depends on being honest, being holistic, being humble, being hopeful, but most of all, reflecting on how this is an issue for the whole of humanity. Thank you again for the privilege of being with you all. Thank you, and I hope that we can stay in contact. Thank you so much, um, uh, Professor Navarro. That was fabulous. I think you touched on many key points, communities, context, humility, willingness to learn, looking for local solutions, working across sectors, and also just not having to know everything and make assumptions and uh, predictions, but much more. You covered much more and far more articulately. We just want to thank you. We want to wrap up this uh, launching session. And in about 15 minutes, we will be joining our new session. Everyone should have the link. So Preeti, could you again place it in the chat box for everyone? And then we will see in about 15 minutes, wherever you are in the world, join us for that first session after the inaugural launch. It's about two years after the pandemic. Very, very interesting speakers from all over the world, uh, from four, five different countries with their experiences. Uh, I just wanted to say thank you again to Dr. Mushtaq Chaudhry, Dr. Said Masood Ahmed, of course, the colleagues here, but especially our keynote speaker and our chief guest. You know, you really, that was just fabulous uh, and very, very interesting and very useful. In fact, timely, because sometimes there's so much confusion and uh, around some of these issues and, and you read so much, there's information overload. And, and you really don't know after a while that, you know, you read this, but then you read that, but then you read this and then you said that. So thank you very much. A very timely needed uh, keynote sort of, I think um, education, uh, that is something we need as, as COVID continues. I, I leave it to Mushtaq Bhai to say goodbye to his, to his colleague and peer before we wrap up. Thank you very much. I, I, I just wanted to thank uh, David for, for your wonderful uh, uh, keynote speech, which has set the tone for this conference. And, and I know, and we know how busy you are, David, and uh, you have given time to this. So thank you very much. We'll be in touch and uh, wish our conference a big success. Thank you very much thank and stay well. Uh, thank you. I pledge to work for vaccine equity above all else. Fabulous. And I, I will do my best. Uh, underneath all this, we see horrible inequities in the global response. So outside yes. my lecture, I wanted to say to you personally, this is my pledge. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Okay, see you everyone. Thank you very much to our audience of almost 200 participants who joined us today. Uh, thank you very much. See you soon in about 15 minutes. Bye bye. Thank bye -bye. you.